have 1,239 um, registered participants participating from 25 countries around the world who have registered on this Think ND platform to join us, which is wonderful and really, really thankful for your participation. I would like to thank the sponsors as I do every session of those who've helped make this book club a reality. Um, and that's the Notre, Notre Dame International, the Keogh Nocton Institute for Irish Studies, the College of Arts and Letters, the Keogh School of Global Affairs, Notre Dame Le Learning, Mendoza School of Business, and of course, the Notre Dame Alumni Association with whom this could not be possible. We've decided to use this, the breakout sessions at the end of the program today. And so this will provide you an opportunity to chat with one another, discuss the topic that we talked about and get a sense of um, what other people think about the topic. And um, if you have any questions, ask one another, it's a good time to just get to know one another and build community. I do encourage you to use the chat function, which has been different from the previous years, which means that our in, in previous iterations, we were using a Google function. What happens with the chat is that it feeds into my colleague Zoe, who will then feed it into me. So she's just highlighted the chat function now. So if you could please use that and, and please use it at any time during the presentation, we'll start collating the questions and I hope to get around to them as soon as um, we start our that part of the um, format for today. Now, if we don't get to them, I want to re remind you all that we do have a moderated discussion board on LinkedIn, which is entitled the Think ND Calmer Book Club. And we do post and engage on that platform should you wish to continue a question or, um, or a, th a stream of thought. So without any further ado, I'd like to welcome Professor Alma McCarthy uh, for this live session today and want to thank her for contributing to her, um, the, to the introductory videos that she shared with us on the, on the Think ND um, platform. Uh, as part of the anticipatory innovation, her talk was entitled, Is the Future of Work Remote? Professor McCarthy is head of the G.J.E. Karn School of Business. And, and economics. She is professor of public sector management at the National University of Ireland in Galway. Her research interests include public sector leadership and human resource development training, work-life balance, and 360 feedback. Her research has influenced national civil service talent de development policy and the Irish government's national remote working strategy. She is a chartered member of the CIPD, the American Academy of Management, the Society for Industrial and Organizational Psychology, and served as elected vice chair and chair of the Irish Academy of Management. She is an accredited member of the British Psychological Society and certified to administer a broad range of cognitive ability, personality, and occupational interest psychometric assessments. So Alma, thank you so much for giving of your time and of your knowledge in this very topical topic that we are about to discuss this in this hour. Great, thanks, thanks Lisa. And it's, it's uh, lovely to be here. And I want to thank you very much for the opportunity and the invitation to speak. Um, and uh, also to Zoe for helping us get online today. So um, as, as Lisa said, my name is Alma McCarthy. I am um, a, a professor and lecturer and now head of the School of Business and Economics at NUI Galway, which is Dean equivalent, I suppose, by most business school standards. Um, I am from County Clare, which is the next county south here, where we're based in, in Galway. Um, so we're along the, the Wild Atlantic Way in Ireland and we're very very lucky to be uh, living where we are that's for sure and uh, I'm sure you see nice pictures there that Lisa puts up of the Kyle Moore building out in Connemara in uh, West Galway. Um, so I assume we're being uh, joined by many many folks who are not living in Ireland and living in the US and, and potentially all over the world. 
Um, so I, I was asked to speak about, I suppose, a study that we have undertaken here, a couple of studies and looking at the whole area of remote working. Um, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that maybe for uh, 10 or 15 minutes or so. And of course, I introduced it in the videos that I sent on and I'll maybe just refresh some of the key things that we looked at there um, in the videos that I sent as well. But maybe just to speak a little bit um, about the, the, the over kind of key findings, if you like. So the picture you're looking at there on your screen now is um, our beautiful quadrangle building um, here at uh, the National University of Ireland in Galway City. Um, it was established in 1845 as Queen's College Galway um, and we have um, grown extensively as an institution um, in that 150 odd year period um, and we have about 18,000 students now from 45 countries around the world um, and it's it's become a very vibrant and great campus with um, you know lots lots happening across all the different faculties and areas. Um, I work in the the area of business um, myself as the school that we are working in. So that is a nice picture of a building that I haven't been in or next night or near for since we closed up shop um, here um, in Ireland on the twelfth of March in twenty twenty. So. Uh, just a little maybe backdrop to, I suppose, the national context and the lockdown here. Um, uh, we've taken quite a strict approach, I suppose, in, in Ireland compared to perhaps the US um, and um, some other countries, depending on who, where you're joining us from. Um, we are now in our third national lockdown where we are, um, you know, not allowed to travel more than five kilometers from our home unless it's for work, uh, essential work, or if we're going for medical reasons. Um, all hospitality is closed. You can only take uh, food as takeout. And at the moment, schools are actually closed as well. And they have been closed since January. So there are no primary, secondary or third level um, education students on campus or in there. In, in, everything is online. So I suppose in, in that context, um, we are sort of, you know, very much working since the middle of March last year. Um, and the government mandate has been to work remotely uh, where at all possible. And even when we've lifted restrictions a little bit, as we did in the summer and in October, November time, um, again, the guidance nationally is those who can work remotely were encouraged to do so. So we're coming up to perhaps, uh, you know, next month we'll be out for a full year. So that that has been a phenomenal uh, sort of social experiment, I suppose, a workplace experiment as to how we how we're getting on. Um, so maybe if we just move on to a couple of the next slides there, that's just the backdrop. I just want to put in a couple of pictures here because I think uh, we have to we have to pay homage to, to the beautiful part of the world we live in. Um, the first image there was a picture of, of Galway Bay, if you want to go back up to it there, Zoe. And uh, um, you can see to the left there are the hills of, of County Clare and the famous Burn. Um, and you're looking out there to the west and it's next, next stop is New York City. Um, so it's it's that is we're just looking there at, at the famous Galway Bay and the sun setting on Galway Bay. And uh, I look forward to maybe inviting and hosting any of you who want to come on campus when travel um, opens up, etc. Um, in, in the in the future. And um, if you want to move on there, Zoe, that would be great. Uh, this is a picture taken out in Connemara, lovely hills and lakes. And um, of course, our sheep are a very important part of our hinterland. So the Connemara um, is a beautiful part of the world, just uh, out in West County Galway. And the next picture is one I've taken from the city. So we have uh, the famous sort of swans and the, the long walk is an image from the city. We're on, we're on the river and we're also, we're, so we have a, we're a river-based campus and city, the fastest flowing river in Europe goes through Galway. And of course, we're on the, on the Atlantic Ocean as well. So... That is, I have the pleasure of living in this area. So it's it's a nice spot and hopefully as some of you have visited or will get to visit at some stage and you'd be most welcome. So the next slide just kind of provides an overview, I suppose, of some of the work that we've undertaken um, in the Whitaker Institute at NUI Galway. It's a research institute that looks at social um, and, and public policy. And I'm a member of that research institute and you can get more information um, on www.whitakerinstitute.ie forward slash projects. Um, and there's three reports available there, and I mentioned this in the introductory video, so I won't uh, labour the point too much. Um, but we have been taking a snapshot of the sort of employee 
um, experience of this remote working um, experiment, if you like, or, or context that we are in. So the first um, study and report that we did was back in, in April 2020. So it was um, six weeks into lockdown, strict lockdown, people had been thrown into the remote working context, um, you know, in the emergency response and, and we took some uh, took a, a national survey um, at that point in time. We got over seven thousand two hundred responses, and that report is available on the website. Um, we followed up on that national survey in October twenty twenty, and we were interested in seeing how employees were getting on with remote working six months into the process. So, um, you know, we, we were back, schools were back. It was a bit more uh, support in terms of elder care and things like that. So, uh, and we wanted to see what the trends were like six months on. We're going to repeat the study again um, in April this year, just to kind of be able to trend and monitor. Um, those reports again are available on the Whitaker Institute website. And the last report that's there, the third one on, as we come down along the steps, is, is, look, is a, a report that I worked on with a, the Western Development Commission, which is a, a state agency tasked with looking at regional development along the Western seaboard in Ireland from Donegal down to um, South uh, Cork and all the counties along the West, which would include uh, uh, Sligo, Mayo, Galway, Clare, Kerry and County Cork. Uh, some of you might have visited those counties if you were ever here um, in the country. Um, and I suppose one of the, the, the issues we have had in terms of national development plans is a lot of the attention, a lot of investment tends to go into the capital. And this is something that we've struggled with as a national, as a country, um, happens, I suppose, in many countries, that a lot of economic activity and development uh, gets pulled into the into the capital, which is Dublin in our context. Um, and that sort of more balanced regional development perspective is, is kind of hard to achieve. Uh, so the Western Development Commission um, has that remit of that regional development. And of course, we're interested in the remote working context as an enabler of, of regional development as well. Uh, so there's a report there that's also looking at some of the key issues um, that might be of interest to you. So I suppose we're drawing our, our findings from, from this empirical data set um, and trying to project maybe what are some of the, the anticipated implications post crisis for what workplace will look like in our experience of the workplace. Um, so you might move on, Zoe, if that's okay, please. Um, so I just pulled out some of the key kind of findings that we have from our, our studies and the data. So the first study that we did six weeks into the crisis, we had 7,241 responses from across the country, across different sectors and industries. Um, and most of them at that stage, 87% uh, were working uh, fully remotely. 11% uh, of respondents were doing a mix of on-site and remote where some of their work was deemed essential. Um, and then only 2% were working fully on-site or they weren't working at all. So they, were, they weren't brought forward in the, in the questionnaire. Um, so it's a very extensive data set. Then six months on, uh, we got a very high response again of, of 5,639 responses to our, again, a national survey. At this stage, so the lockdown had lifted to a, um, a, a less severe level. So there were 68% working fully remotely of the respondents, 24 a mix of on-site and remote, and 8% were fully on-site. So we're, a lot were of our respondents here and what we're interested in is those working substantially remotely for most or, or, or all of the time. Um, so Zoe, you can move on there, please. So as I just look at these slides, we're looking at uh, the, what you're looking at on the left hand screen is from the, the initial April 2020 um, survey. And at that stage, what we found extremely surprising was that 80, even in the crisis scenario with only six weeks experience, 83% uh, uh, want to work remotely for some or all of the time post crisis. So people had got used to this and were um, to an extent, uh, you know, saying that they would like to continue to have remote working um, as an option for some or all of the time. And if we look at splitting this out, 12% um, in April wanted to continue to work fully remotely. 42% would like to work remotely several times a week. So that's two or three days a week working from home or remotely, and then the other period of time in the office. 29% would like to work uh, remotely several um, times a month. 
and then the remainder didn't want to work remotely. And there's a rounding issue there that brings it to 100%. And interestingly, 51% of the respondents had never worked remotely before. So that was really interesting. And when we looked at the differences, there were no differences. So some people had gone from being fully on site five days a week and never working from home or remotely. 51% of the respondents came from that scenario um, and others had maybe some experience of working remotely. So interestingly, by the time we come to October, six months on, a lot more um, experience of it, the numbers have gone up substantially in terms of the employees who want to continue to work remotely for summer all of the time post-crisis. And one of the biggest differences, nearly one in, or over one in four want to work remotely on a full-time basis. Um, so we find this statistic uh, kind of very interesting. So one in four employees want to work fully remotely post-crisis in the survey that we've done. Uh, and that is of the 5,600 respondents nationally. Um, the vast majority, um, then over half, want to work remotely several times a week within that. Um, and only 6% do not want to work remotely at all. So I suppose that's a really interesting finding. You can see the trend has moved upwards in terms of what employees want. I suppose what's important here is this is an employee um, survey. So it is the employees' um, experiences and perceptions that we're seeing. Uh, we will speak later on about how employers and organizations can and will respond to this because this is only the employee preference. Um, our findings here, though, replicate many other studies that have been done. If you if you look into this area and you, you do some research in that, um, it's very clear that for, there's a big proportion of the workforce that does not want to go back to what they were doing uh, pre-crisis, can see the merit of having more flexibility, can see the value of having uh, a blended approach. But clearly, um, the vast majority want that blend, you know, the mix. Um, uh, and that's what we're, we're hearing coming out of, of the data. Um, if we move on there, Zoe, please. Um, so these are just top line findings. If you want more detail, you go into the reports. There's lots of information available uh, in, in the reports. Um, the top three advantages of remote working are no traffic and no commute. I mean, that's these are intuitively makes sense. Um, it's very hard to picture sitting in traffic for hours on end um, when people have successfully been able to work remotely and don't have that. Um, so, you know, these are our benefits that we can uh, take out of this crisis. And I suppose the impacts on the environment and everything are very significant. We're actually looking at the last survey we did. We gathered um, tra travel data and um, car details and all that. We're doing work with um, geographers and engineers on actually looking at the climate impact of just taking our sample um, of respondents. And it's already quite substantial when you look at the positive impact on climate by taking off taking all this travel out, out of this out of the equation and uh, greater flexibility as to how they manage the working day and the reduced costs of course of going to work now of course you know it isn't all uh, wonderful and it comes with a whole suite and and incredible set of challenges um, and that's for sure and certain and they are they are the the kind of issues that we have to grapple with now as employers as hr specialists um, and how we look at how we deal with the challenges. The, the advantages are there and, and are clear to be seen. So loneliness and isolation was the top rated uh, uh, challenge or problem facing our respondents. Um, in this was October 2020, the last survey we did, staying motivated, their physical workspace. So, um, you know, depending on your setup, some people were working in very cramped situation or maybe around the kitchen table, uh, depending on their actual setup in terms of their homes and their houses and if they're in apartments and who they're sharing accommodation with. Um, can you move on there, please, um, Zoe? And there's other challenges as well. Um, you can just click that again there. Now that picture there again is from Salt Hill. So again, that's another nice image there in the background of, of Galway Bay and looking um, out over the Atlantic Ocean taken from Salt Hill, which is our promenade and walk uh, west of the city. So I suppose just to think about how am I doing for time there, um, Lisa? You're right for me to go on for another few minutes. Yeah, yeah, that's fine, Alma. Okay, perfect. Um, I suppose what's coming out of that data and what are some of the the the, the opportunities, challenges, and future directions? So if you want to bring up the next point there, um, thanks. So I suppose the big question is what we will retain and what will be sustained. Uh, sustain, sustain even, um, post-crisis. So at the moment in Ireland, uh, with our, our national public health advice, we don't have a choice 
organisations are, are being told uh, and mandated to allow remote working where we can. Uh, what is the future of work when we're out of this crisis and when we have um, we have choice and we can do uh, what we need to do and we're not constrained? Um, to us, it's very clear from our research that things are very unlikely to go back to the way they were. Um, so, and, you know, we see a lot of, of discussion and narrative in the media about this in terms of even what organizations are doing and giving their employees um, choices in terms of, of where they work. And we've heard companies like LinkedIn and, and, and Facebook and so on and so forth, making statements around, um, you know, enabling this in a real way uh, post-crisis and into the future. So I, I think I would argue that the future is, is, is not fully remote. It is probably going to be a, a hybrid or blended or flex or distributed or anywhere workforce. These are the terms that we're starting to see come into the parlance and the um, uh, narrative of, of the future of work. So it is highly likely for many organizations will end up in a blended model where a substantial portion of their workforce is working from home or working remotely um, at any given point in time. So there are case examples that we refer to in the third report that I mentioned there, um, and the work we did with the Western Development Commission, we've taken case studies and Cisco is one company that's in there um, and they are already preparing for having 30 to 40% of their workforce that will not be um, office-based every day. Um, so organizations are starting to, to look at this um, in a real way. So it will be a blended model that comes with a lot of challenges. So um, at the moment, when we're all remote, we're all the same and it brings similar challenges for everyone. If we have this blended where some are in, some are out at, on different days and on different sort of um, schedules, it definitely is a, a more of a challenge for, for an organization to make sure that we can continue to have those who are working remotely have the same positive experience as those who might be in the in the work, uh, in the work in the office, um, that we st have still good connections with people and so on and so forth. It is kind of a, it's going to be difficult, but it, it, it does look like the way of the future. Um, Salesforce, interestingly, huge organization there, um, headquartered in San Francisco, and they just um, invested billions in their big Salesforce tower in San Fran have come out and made a very clear statement that there will be three options uh, for working with them. The flex option that will allow employees to come into the office up to three days per week. Uh, some will work fully remotely all of the time and a small subset will come in every day. So Salesforce have come out on the uh, World Economic Forum uh, article there and they've actually called out how it's going to be. Um, so it's, it's, that's what looks like um, the future, uh, I would uh, predict and, and put money on uh, in terms of where, where it's going to go. So it is, it's, that's going to be a, a clear difference. Um, on the next um, point there is, I suppose, a real critical um, issue for everyone and challenge is how organizations and how human resource uh, professionals and the human resource function um, responds. So clearly the research indicates employees have this preference to move um, the, uh, the majority of them to a blended model. Um, and then the, all of the organizational policies and practices and that need to be set up to facilitate that. And that is not going to be easy. Um, and interestingly, I suppose there is a significant mindset change required to facilitate it. So, you know, some of the discussion and narrative that I, I've heard and been part of conflates some sort of fundamental issues um, and muddies the waters a little bit. So I've I've been involved in conversations around how can we manage performance um, if, if you can't see people and this remote working and working from home leads to higher levels of underperformance. And, you know, that's a bit of a mis misperception really of reality. If, if you've underperformers um, in your in your work Force. And a large organization will inevitably have a, have a number, I suppose, that aren't um, performing to the level you might want. Whether they're physically at work or working elsewhere, um, that's not really the issue. We did have underperformance issues when people were physically at work. So just because you can see somebody doesn't mean they're actually productive. Um, so sometimes that this notion that it's going to be hard to manage performance because you can't see if people are working, that has to change and has to move to a task based approach to how we manage and how we uh, assess performance. Um, and we need to move and trust people, I suppose, that they are performing, but it's clear what the expectations are. So it's not about a physical attendance equals performance or that you can that that notion has to go. Um, 
but as I say, there's there's significant challenges with with making it um, making it work. Of course, the other big big issue is the impact on employee well being, um, and I think any of us that are working remotely and have been for a long period of time. And I was speaking with Lisa and Zoe at the start, like it is kind of difficult to keep uh, you know positive sometimes and, and and how do we stay connected how do we keep employees engaged how do we facilitate that collaborative learning that happens when we come together um in organizations so the well-being piece is 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 definitely a real challenge but i think at the moment is particularly challenging because we're also in the irish context here we're in a national lockdown so there's a bit of sense of doom and gloom and our vaccination rollout isn't going as fast as we would like and they're prolonging the lockdown we're in now into april and so I suppose there is well-being issues to deal with the pandemic and then there's the workplace well-being um but again organizations can can manage that if we're in a better sort of national health context um the next bullet point there is just around government strategy so interestingly here in ireland um our tánaiste which is the irish word for our um the second in command uh, to our Prime Minister, our Taoiseach, and the Minister for the Department of Enterprise, Trade and Employment, um, has set out a national remote working strategy, which was just published in January uh, for, for the country. And the plan is to legislate to enable employees to request the right to work remotely. So this is a very brave move, and they referenced a lot of our research here at NUI Galway and the Whitaker Institute. Um, and I think they, they, you know, moved even beyond what a lot would have expected. And uh, the plan is to legislate that employees have the right to request to work remotely. Now, that doesn't mean that you will be granted the, the entitlement. But once you legislate for the right to request, um, organisations, you know, will need to be very clear on why they can't allow that. And in our context here, a lot of, of, of organised, a lot of jobs where, uh, you know, professional and management oriented roles in technology, um, sort of sector, etc. We have proven that we can deliver that um, our, our we can perform remotely. So it's going to be very difficult for organizations to, to have a blanket ban on remote working if the government moves ahead with the legislation. And that is the plan. So there's and, and the government here are, are they have a, um, a target to have 30 percent of the public sector uh, working remotely of all the government employees working remotely. So there's a huge huge policy move here um, at a national level to enable remote working. And the last point is around the regional development agenda. And I mentioned this in the context of the work that we've done with the Western Development Commission. Uh, remote working, I suppose, does present, provide um, a very real opportunity for more balanced regional development. Uh, you might recall, I mentioned the issue with the pull to the capital earlier on. Um, and um, we have struggled with that regional development uh, piece around careers because a lot of the big companies, and if you wanted to be successful, however you define success um, in your career, you'd have, you know, Dublin was the place to be where the big companies are and where you can move around and, and get your opportunities to progress. Um, and the sense was if you moved out of the capital, it was kind of almost career death, you know, it's the graveyard of ambition to do that because you wouldn't have the same opportunities. Now you could have as you know, you can have as good a career uh, uh, prospect and salary if you can work remotely in what we call Bell Mullet, which is the western tip of Mayo, County Mayo on the west of Ireland, as, as you do in, in the heart of Dublin, depending depending on what sector you, you are in. It is sector, sector specific. So there's a great opportunity um, in terms of regional development. Of course, those who own real estate in the cities are not pleased. So there's all this two sides to every coin, I suppose. Um, and for example, you know, one of the things we've seen here is the death of the city centre and the economy that comes from having a, a very vibrant workforce. Um, and we've seen sort of the more, you know, the coffees, shops on the suburbs, etc., doing much better. So it's going to be very difficult, I suppose, to see how all of that will pan out. I think it will, there will be a swing back to a point, but I do see very much the future being a blended, flex, hybrid, distributed, um, or anywhere workforce for, for those organizations that can. Um, I suppose the other thing I'll just finish on is um, it is important to state that our, our research does focus on those sectors, those roles and those uh, jobs that lend themselves to remote working. So not every sector obviously um, can do this or, or would be able to do this where people have to be physically present. Um, so that kind of takes me through some of the sort of key top level um, 
areas I, I wanted to chat about. Um, so thanks for listening. Thanks, Alma. That was actually really, really great in way of um, putting your work and research succinctly. Um, I would like to bring up just from the last point you mentioned about, um, you know, one of the challenges from working remotely in a rural setting um, is, is really the, the national broadband that we have in Ireland. And I don't know if you saw in the news yesterday, Elon Musk has decided to drop some sort of satellite into County Kerry so that the, the people in, the, in that region near Malls Gap can get better internet. I wonder if you could talk a bit about the national, you know, to, to, you know the national broadband plan and to what extent your report could influence the government in, in improving Ireland's national broadband plan and to get you know internet to to all aspects of an island uh, as, as small as it is here in Ireland yeah no it's, it's a good question I, it came up now we thought that the broadband issue would have come up higher so we got them to rank their challenges and um, it didn't come up in the top three I think it was fourth or fifth but then I suppose it's maybe a chicken and an egg situation in that those who were able to work remotely and had the broadband were responding to the survey so this we have to kind of be conscious of that the National Broad Broadband Plan uh, in Ireland is, um, yeah, is really vital, really vital for regional development, and that has come up very strongly in our recommendations. Um, it's vital for kids as well. I mean, the way of the world is technology, um, and much and all as we would have seen, maybe cursed the kids on screens and uh, PlayStation, you know, gaming and all of that. Now, you know, in a where they're locked down and they're not supposed to physically meet anyone, you can actually see the benefits of of, of it. Um, so for kids' education, for, for everything, it's it's vital. It's absolutely vital. Uh, one of the things that is happening where uh, that broadband plan and the fibre uh, connectivity isn't good is um, there's investment in what they call um, hubs. So along the Western, again, the Western Development Commission with the Atlantic uh, Economic Corridor here is investing in what they call regional hubs so that maybe within 10 or 15 miles of your home, you can go to a hub that has a, a desk that you can work in that has excellent connectivity. Um, yeah, when you look at the beautiful pictures of Ireland, this is a challenge. You know, how do you get good broadband out to the wilds of Mayo or West Clare or Kerry? And indeed, it's not just the rural part of Ireland. There are parts, I've better broadband here than some parts of some cities. So it just depends on the, the but we're a bit slow on that, uh, Lisa. I don't know how you're set up there in your own home, but I'm lucky in that I have good connectivity, but not everyone does. And uh, it is a challenge for sure. Ironically, we have better internet at Kyamore because of the fiber that we were able to lie, lay for the Kyamore estate. Um, but me just being outside, if, if, if I'm just outside of Dublin, I, I, I am not part of that national broadband pan if I'm in a little pocket. So the internet can be intermittent. Um, but I do think it's essential for if, if we're going to stay remote that we do have to really push the government to, to get the national rollout done. Uh, just to remind you all that we are taking questions in the chat. So please feel free to ask any questions you have of Alma. One of the, um, if you, uh, one of the questions I have Alma um, is, is about the impact of, of what your study might have found about effective leadership in remote situations. And you touched on it a bit about being you know, task-based assessments. Have you noticed in your own experience in the work that you do personally, as well as the work that you did uh, for, um, for, the, for the report, what attributes or tools that successful leaders have that have adopted to, 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 be, to working remotely successfully? Uh, and what it, you know, have you seen evidence of a set of skills of successful leaders that does lend itself to remote work? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, I, I suppose there's been a huge transition for a lot of managers in that, you know, trying to move to um, change how, how you view how work gets done, uh, providing more flexibility. So, you know, at the moment here now, there are some of my colleagues have very young children and we've no childcare and we've no school. So you have to be very cognizant of of when and how people do their work. Um, but I've noticed even in my own role, like we've 130 staff uh, in our school, like the vast, vast majority of people are, are working incredibly hard. And that is actually a challenge. I think people really put their shoulders to the wheel and got into crisis mode and, and wanted to do their very best. And did, we did phenomenal things very quickly. Um, 
that we would have taken a decade otherwise. I mean, the move to online, we weren't an online institution. Uh, we had some, some areas had better experience in online, but largely we were an in-person on-campus learning institution. And overnight like that, we had to plan to go online and, and did. Um, so it's been phenomenal to watch that and the goodwill of employees has been incredible. Um, but I think the mindset change that I spoke about is, is key. So like it's been very clear on what the tasks are, are for a week or for a day or whatever your kind of rhythm of work allocation is. And, you know, giving people the latitude to arrive at how they're going to achieve that. And if that means working late at night, if you have young kids and when they're in bed or whatever you, way you need to do that, I guess at the end of the week or the day or the month, if the work is done and done to good standard, then should it matter how it's how or when it's done? Not really. Uh, so I think good managers have provided that flexibility. There's, it's very difficult at the moment to know, like some people are very resilient and they're kind of getting on with it and they're doing very well in a very difficult situation. Others are, are struggling. People have hugely different contexts personally. Some people have lost relatives to COVID. They've lost relatives outside of that anyway. So here in Ireland, anyone that's familiar with the Irish, for example, um, you know, our, how we do death and how we uh, celebrate funerals is an ex exceptionally ritualistic, um, very big sort of social support event. So if you're from the country here in Ireland uh, before COVID, um, you know, people, you, people know each other for miles around, hundreds and hundreds would come over a period of two days to a funeral and to sympathize and there's a very, very nice ritual, I suppose, that goes with that. That is completely gone. Now, you can only have 10 people in the church for a funeral service. So even I think people are having to deal with some of these very big issues. I know that's not a workplace issue per se, but there are people dealing with huge issues around childcare that they don't have access to and all that. So, and even how people are dealing with the bigger sort of challenge of the pandemic. So good managers are trying to provide that the supports that are needed. Um, it's hard to know what works for some people. They're not, you know, sort of even this book club works for some people. It probably doesn't work for others. Um, you know, having online quizzes works for some. We're all getting a bit of zoomitis now. There's, so it's it's very hard to know what to do. Um, and that personal connection is really challenging to, to emulate in the, in the online context. Well, I do think it was interesting what you said in this presentation that like, I suppose, task-oriented people who were task-oriented or before the pandemic are, are, are able to transition to be task-oriented during the pandemic. Um, one of the questions I have from, from Daniel, um, did you find evidence though that people were more or less productive working from home? Like, have you found actual evidence of that? Um, of course, like we mentioned obligations um, for homeschooling and, you know, the, and, and, and the, you know, the, the tribulations that causes with regards to time. Um, but have you, have you found actual results of it being more or less productive? Um, yeah, so in the survey, um, you can have a look at that. I, I think Daniel asked the question. Um, if you go into the website, uh, we have some details on that. Now, the production, uh, the productivity levels are self-report. But uh, so, you know, that's an employee's own perception of their own productivity. Um, so, but it's still a valuable um, insight. Um, and people maintain that they were more productive. I, I can't remember exactly the, the numbers off the top of my head, but there was quite a substantial um, percentage that thought they were more productive or as productive. Um, and there was, that was the majority compared to less productive. It depends as well on the, the childcare scenario. So some people have smaller kids at home that, you know, impacts on their productivity when schools are closed. Um, a few older kids might be easier. I've, I've three older kids, so they can manage, uh, they can kind of self, self um, manage. Well, theoretically, they're supposed to be managing downstairs, doing their homework, what not, and you hope they are. But um, yeah, the perception was that they were, were more productive. Now that could be a confluencing issue there around uh, the crisis. People were willing to put their shoulders to the wheel. And one of the issues we have is people are finding it hard to switch off. So that's not necessarily great. You could be more productive, but you know, like you're just going from your office now to the kitchen. So there is no commute time. You're not finishing to maybe, you know, by a certain time to get out and miss traffic or whatever. So if it means we're more productive because we're actually working longer hours, that's not necessarily a great thing long term for health and well-being. Um, but of course, if we are saving time in a, a long commute. So some people in Dublin, for example, the city would be spending at least two hours a day commuting. 
uh, you know, 10 hours a week, that's phenomenal. I mean, if you if you think about the waste of time that is, um, you know, if you spend just half of that time actually working, uh, you know, there's, there would be a lift in productivity. So yeah, people were, um, productivity was higher. Um, now employers would be interested to know what they say. Um, I, one of the observations from the report, Alma, are that organizations sh um, should ensure that employees who are working remotely have sufficient and impactful opportunities for both formal in and informal engagement, as well as social interaction with colleagues. This has come up even in my own workforce. Uh, what, has the finding, what has the findings been for successful ways of facilitating such engagement? Have, you know, what, what does that look like? Because I suppose what we don't have at the moment is that water cooler talk, you know, in or before a Zoom call, right? Or the kind of nuances of, of of things that are getting accomplished, which which are outside the parameters of what you're trying to work on in the Zoom, that's kind of being lost. So I'm curious as to to, to what sort of um, informal engagements that you've you've come across. Yeah, again, I suppose it depends on people's preferences. There was a lot of of, of efforts early on to have sort of informal, um, you, you know, Zoom quiz, um, uh, you know, online events to kind of pull people together. My sense is that has lost maybe its shine a little bit in that people are kind of going, oh, you know, it is difficult to, to replicate. I mean, I've, I was at a conference, the um, AECSB conference all this week, which is um, a conference for business school deans. And, um, you know, they, they've been trying to replicate online coffee breaks and they've put in, uh, you know, online concerts and they have uh, speed networking and things. Um, now, it, some people like that and they work well at it and others just switch off from that session and they're, they're, they're gone. So it is, it, it is hard. Um, some of the things that are working are, are um, s s one of the things that has worked in one company is that they, they give a snack box out once a month for when they're doing their team meeting. Uh, so that when you're having, a, you're, you know, you, you have your sort of, everyone's eating the same thing or they're able to talk about what has arrived in their, their box. Um, others, uh, depending on the company in the public sector, we wouldn't do this now, but others might send down beer or wine. Um, so, and you say, we'll come on, we'll have a social event online. And I suppose you're doing the best you can with the situation you're in, because here we're just not allowed to congregate. And I don't think we will be for quite some time. Um, but definitely you have to over communicate. So again, organizations that are doing it well, they're probably over communicating. Um, uh, and providing opportunities to dip in for virtual coffees. In the School of Business, we had our Pancake Tuesday. We had a virtual pancake event um, and it was good. We had about 25 at that. Um, and, you know, we talked about what your favorite topics were and different things like that, just trying to maybe just jazz it up a little bit. Um, but it's, it, is, it is hard to replicate, as you say, the water cooler, the sort of go for coffee, um, the maybe informal drink or whatever you might be doing. It, it, it is challenging. There's no doubt about it. Well, the amount of work that you do actually outside of that hour too, like it, it, that's what I've noticed now as we are longer in, in it. Um, I have a question from Paul. With so many people working remotely, how do leaders onboard new employees, um, acc acclimatize new people to the culture of the organization and create a sense of team belonging and sh shared mission and, and values? Yeah, it's a really good question. Um, onboarding is, is very challenging. Um, the other thing that's very challenging is, uh, well, I suppose it might be connected, is is a uh, new, younger generation employees. So at our stage, at my stage, I suppose I, I'm lucky in that I know I know the team I'm working with. Most of them, we have had some new people join, but I I, I kind of know something about them I, I um, and it makes life easier. If you are um, starting out in your career, there's an awful lot that we learn, you know, informally by a process of osmosis, by watching people and observing and learning about the culture and what's accepted and what's not and what works and what doesn't. This never taught in a formal context that you won't pick up in, in a, a handbook uh, or, a, you know, a, a, an onboarding a manual or video or whatever. So it is very challenging. Um, it, again, I suppose it's making sure that the person that comes in it, there is a structured process for them to 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 meet people uh, that they are have a body um that's one thing that we've done in one of the departments here there's a, a body that you work with when you come in that isn't your manager um, and that you've you know organized meetings with them for the first few weeks or months to get up to speed um other organizations use mentors it's never more important than now to do that um because uh, yeah that is really challenging so how do you start a new job where you 
you you you you leave the, 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 the your kitchen table at, at, at nine o'clock on Monday morning. You're working for uh, ABC Limited, potentially in a different city or country, uh, and you you nothing you never go in there. It's it is really challenging. That's that's what's very difficult to replicate, and that's where the the blended and model is really required. I have a question from Thomas, and I actually don't know the I've, I don't know what the answer to this is, is. Is how are public libraries in Ireland handling the lockdown? Are they offering services remotely? I only know from I know I knew of a, a library bus that showed up when the school kids were in session, Alma, but I don't know how um, the libraries in Ireland are, are are actually functioning right now. Um, some of them have a click and collect, click and collect service. Um, so you would come and come to the desk, they might just have a little, just one part of it open and you would have ordered your books and you would collect. So that's what some of them are doing. Um, uh, so th that's how they'd be doing it, Thomas, I think, um, when they open up. At the moment, they probably aren't even open, I don't think, in, in level five. So once we come down from the next level of restriction down, uh, you would be able to click and collect because, of course, technically here we're not supposed to go beyond five kilometres. Uh, so collecting books in libraries wouldn't be essential travel. So I think at the moment there wouldn't be any services, but when we move to the next level, it would be a click and collect service. Question from Barry. Is there much research being done on how small offices are transitioning to remote working, especially when some of the staff do not have reliable broadband? Um, yeah, it, it, I suppose that again, here we don't have a choice. So whether you're big, large or, or, or small, it's if you're able to, then you're, you're supposed to, to work remotely. Um, where you have a case where you don't have connectivity or you don't have the resources, you, you can travel into your workplace um, and you can you could work in your office, but you'd have to be adhering to social distancing and all of that. And it would, it, that's an exception rather than a norm. Um, so Barry, in that context, people would have, where you're able to claim that you cannot do it at home um, and that's a reasonable uh, claim, then you, you can go into, into the workplace. Um, but again, everything is, is, is online. So, you know, the, all meetings, even uh, for those who might be in an office, even if they're peppered around in the office, it, all the meetings mostly are happening online. Even if you're in the office, it would be an online meeting because those who aren't in there um, will be online. And even if you're in, you're supposed to be socially distanced now at two meters. So this is the challenge we have ahead is, as to how we actually come out of this, because it's not going to be a drop dead. Okay, everything is fine now. Like it'll probably be retaining social distancing for some period of time, what mask wearing and um, hand sanitization. So, you know, I suppose our Taoiseach, our prime minister here, when he made the announcement, he actually made the announcement of, of our national lockdown initially um, in March on the steps of the White House, I think in Washington, he was over for St. Patrick's Day. Um, and he made the statement back then that it's much easier to go into lockdown than it would be that it will be to come out of it, and that was a very insightful view way back when we were all naive. I mean, back in March 2020, we all assumed we'd be back at work and everything would be fine by September, you know. Um, now he, I suppose, we have the benefit of of him being uh, from the medical profession. He's a doctor by his by his initial trade, um, so you know he made that statement back then, and that is going to be unfortunately the, the challenge we've ahead is how we come out of this and how we transition out, and it won't be a quick transition, you know, unfortunately. In terms of career development, Alma, have you, has your report um, seen any sort of like, from, from the remote working, has career, career development kind of stalled or have people, you know, stayed within their, um, like where they are in the job or have you seen, um, a, you know, career kind of projection, um, you know, with rises or with, or, or have you seen a sort of stagnation of, of this sort of like where people are at, or have you seen movement within within other like um, you know movement for other positions or raises and things like that? How, what have you observed in for career development in with remote working? Yeah, so initially I think there was uh, organizations where everything was paused. So, uh, you know, at the crisis was looming and a lot of organizations went into pause mode. So you would have paused appointments and promotions and things like that, unless you had vacancies, I suppose. Um, but now as it prolongs, of course, that isn't an option. We have to start to start dealing with it and managing it um, and so on. So, um, yeah, I mean, people are changing roles. They're switching organizations. They're starting jobs. Um, to go back to the, was it Paul or did ask about the onboarding? Um, 
yeah, it, like life goes on uh, and, and people are moving and they are taking up roles and they are getting promoted. Um, it's much more challenging, but it's, it certainly is, is happening for those sectors that are doing OK. So the health sector, you know, medical device um, technology is doing very well. Education is, is continuing. A lot of challenges for education, obviously. But, um, you know, I suppose the biggest impact that we have at, at, at a in terms of sectors of the economy would be hospitality and travel like that's that's completely ground to a halt here and it's very worrying as to where that would go so you know when when we do when we do return to some sort of you know in person working and we you mentioned blended working and from your studies it looks like overwhelmingly that people who did start working remotely found it you know found it a, a good way to work um, but but what do you know when we look at the blended model? You know, will certain people be at disadvantage if they're going to be working from home more than others? And there's certain people in certain types of their or as different you know stations of their life where they you know it it, it is conducive to work from home and it's it's you know there would be less time to go to the office. You know, when you when you look at your own experience from your own work, those who choose to work more remotely from home and those to be in the office, if they have that sort of option what kind of impact would that have in that career and how can governments like can governments protect people or how 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 realistic are we about in-person work versus remote work yeah it's a great question i mean in our task force work with the western development commission we had a task force of um, us as academics and uh, policymakers and private sector employers and public sector employers. It was a good mix um, of people. And um, the conclusion that we had come to from our, our conversations and research was that when everyone is working remotely, it's it's easier because it's this it's this it's this leveler. It's it's very democratic. Everybody's having the same experience, whether that's good, bad, or indifferent. The challenge has been in the past where you've had uh, cohorts or sectors that are out and then you have cohorts that are in. Um, and if the people who are out are not getting the same access to uh, colleagues who are in, you know, making decisions about uh, pr promotion and all that, they're not as well known. If they're not getting access to the water cooler moments, the real meetings that happen before or after the official meeting, um, that is definitely a disadvantage. Um, so going forward, uh, like organizations in a blended model, it, it's a very, it's going to be a very concerted uh, decision that's required around how do you, even when we have meetings, like, you know, having someone off, the, the five people who are physically in, at the meeting in the meeting room and, and having five people join on a screen as little dots that you can see which was kind of the way it was done before when we used to do it. You could ring into a meeting, but like you knew it was going to be a far inferior experience for most of people than compared to being physically there. That has to change. So, you know, people will have to connect. And even I was, we were actually looking at the physical way this could be done at a meeting where screens actually come around the table and you're like you're sitting. I know it sounds very basic, but that the four people who are physically here are sitting down, but the screens are as big and they're literally around the table, but virtual so that they're coming into that and they are able to see they are sitting at the table on their screen and they can see those around the table. So even the psychology of how we meet is really important to your experience of do, do you, are you going to be seen as a second class citizen if you're off site versus experience you get on site? That is going to be a challenge. Um, I don't. I hope you don't mind. I've got two more questions, and uh, um, I, from Jim. Uh, and I, I, it's I guess um, subject specific. Have you noticed like engineering science professions that perform computer s simulations that involve large models or via like for example vehicle um, aerodynamics doing like how are they doing with their work working from home? So specifically in the engineering and scientific. I guess, areas. Have you observed how their work is um, progressing? I, not specifically, no, to be honest. Um, but I, I suppose what we have seen is it depends on if, it, you know, it depends on the technology that's been used. If you, if you need big equipment and lab based work and very um, sort of um, key software that you don't have at home or you can't get at home, obviously, um, then that's maybe that's deemed essential work and people have to go in and physically work on, on site. And there is an element of that going on in manufacturing, et cetera. You know, people 
they can't do that at home. Um, so it, it depends on the nature of work, like uh, very much what we were interested in is people who could do their work remotely. So, um, you know, software and technology where you can access your stuff on a computer obviously lends itself to working anywhere. But if you, if you do need a, a infrastructure equipment, uh, to not enable you to do the work and that's not available to you at home, then, you know, that that continues apace uh, uh, in the workplace. Okay, I got a question from Mary. Um, and it follows on from, I guess, um, the question about uh, progressing in your careers. I'll read it out. One of the most important questions I think that will be raised afterwards is that it challenges the notion that you have to be married to your job in order to advance. I think this is particularly a mindset in the corporate world. From an ethical perspective, how likely do you think employers are going to take the well-being of a work-life balance into account when they're thinking about fostering company policies moving forward? Yeah, again, I, I suppose the... Uh, there's so many different factors at play, like national culture plays a part here. Um, so I worked myself in the States. I worked in New York City. I had the good fortune of, of working there for a year with New York Life Insurance in midtown Manhattan. Now I've, I, my brother lives in Chicago and I've been in Chicago uh, for a couple of different stints as well. Um, and I would, uh, uh, dare I say, but I think that, that that sort of you have to be married and work long hours thing um, would be maybe more of a, of a more uh, dominant in the US than it would be here. So there's a lot of discourse here about quality of, of working life um, and work life balance. And we have much better um, employee protections and legislation. There's a huge suite of legislation here, which employers would actually find difficult to navigate sometimes, but protects employees. Like we have a working time directive. We have um, a very good holiday entitlements uh, in terms of, I think a lot of the time in the United States, some people are working to 10 days kind of annual leave here. You know, that would be much higher. 2025 would be the norm plus public holidays. Um, so I think there's a cultural, national cultural uh, difference as well. And then, of course, there's differences in different industries and sectors. So even here, where we might have more of a work-life balance focus, some sectors are still seen to be cutthroat. Like if you want to do well in the legal profession or the consulting profession, yeah, you kind of see that you have to give up, give up your soul to be married to the job and work long hours. But again, a lot of research coming in, uh, Mary, that talks about like long hours doesn't mean higher levels of productivity. So I suppose... The debate is changing for those interested in the well-being dimension, um, but it is hard to change those cultures and presenteeism, like that the really, uh, those who are real go-getters and who are going to succeed in their career are physically present morning, noon and night, and you have to be late leaving the office, otherwise you're, you know, you're not perceived to be uh, serious. Like we, we here in Ireland, I would say in a lot of industries and sectors would be questioning, I suppose, those assumptions. Um, but that is a national and probably sectoral uh, sort of specific factors at play. Okay, I'm going to be cheeky and ask one last one, Mary Alma. I hope you don't mind. Um, yeah. Have you found, it's from Kathleen and it's a very good question. Have you found any evidence of burnout considering, um, you know, there is no official working time when you do remote work? Uh, yeah, so there was like, uh, even in our own organization, where it, there's a lot of, 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 of narrative around well-being, burnout, uh, people working long hours, people logging back in at night. I, I mean, I do it myself. And I was saying in jest actually earlier today to someone else, like there's, there's nothing else to do unless I'm going to watch more Netflix or whatever. So there's also that kind of, well, we can't go anywhere at the weekends. We can't go out to eat. We can't go visit our family. So you're kind of, oh, geez, you might as well log in, you know. Um, but hopefully that'll move on. Um, yeah, I mean, it is, there is, there is definitely a well-being issue there um, around. Uh, and organizations are doing a lot. There's a lot of rhetoric, but I suppose you have to put in place practical Measure. So, for example, you know, with a lot of focus and, and discussion in our university about well-being, and that's great. But then how do you actually enact it? Because it's one thing to say it, it's another thing to do it. But um, so, for example, we've decided in the School of Business that we're taking um, the, the Easter week is going to be, we've sort of proposed that we have no meetings and disciplines or at the school level, if we possibly can, uh, so that people have, and there's no teaching that week that you can say, look, you can take some annual leave and and it is downtime to organize your time. So we have that meeting light week and we'll probably do more of that because unless you actually put in practical supports, 
people are still kind of pulled in and, and people are saying as opposed to your point um, Kathleen people are saying that there's an awful lot more meetings you have to balance that so having loads of meetings to connect people can actually be uh, counterproductive because people are going oh my god you have to go on another zoom meeting now and you still have all your work to do um so yeah it's 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 a uh, it's it's it, that well-being and burnout is an issue well, on behalf of Think ND and um, our guests on this call this afternoon, this evening, I want to thank you, Alma, for um, for, for being so great and for um, presenting this afternoon. It was an excellent presentation, and we um, were able to see a lot of uh, takeaways from it. Myself with task-based initiatives and um, uh, my colleague who's also on the call, Mary, who understands the importance of templates and, you know, uh, being able to to, to, to do to do adhere to templates. So, um, but we do have to be cognizant of a work life balance, and even in the time of COVID, and whether or not we return to what we call normal, I think it's fair to say that the way we work has changed forever. So, um, so um, we're going to do a breakout session uh, for the, a few minutes. So you are more than welcome to join. Um, we're, uh, Zoe's going to whisk you off for about 10 minutes so you can discuss the topic amongst the group. And I look forward to seeing you all um, next week for our final session where Sam Miller returns um, for his final session for um, this series. Um, thank you and good evening. Thanks, Lisa. Thanks, Zoe. And thanks, everyone, for joining. Call in to us at, at EUI Galway if you, if you ever make it over to Ireland. Uh, we'd love to, love to see you and welcome you. All right. Thanks a million.